Uh, welcome to this CUBE Unstoppable Domain Showcase. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We've been showcasing all the great content about Web3 and what's going around the corner for Web4. Of course, Unstoppable Domains is one of the big growth stories in the business. Brad Can, the co-founder is here with me of Unstoppable Domains. Brad, great to see you. Thanks for coming on the showcase. Thanks so much for having me. So you have a lot of history in the, in the Web3, they're calling it that, but it's basically crypto and blockchain, you know, the white paper came out and then, you know, how it developed was organically, we saw how that happened. Now you're the co-founder of Unstoppable Domains, you're seeing the mainstream, I would say mainstream, you're seeing Super Bowl commercials, okay? You're seeing it everywhere. So it is, it is here. Stadiums are named after crypto companies. It's here. Hey, it's no longer a fringe, it is reality. You guys are in the middle of it. What's, what's going on with the trend and where does Unstoppable fit in? Where do you guys tie in here? I mean, I think that what's been happening in general, this whole revolution around cryptocurrencies and then NFTs and what Unstoppable Domains is doing, it's all around creating this idea that people can own something uh, that's digital. And this hasn't really been possible before Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the first case. You could own money. You don't need a bank. No one else, you, know, you can completely control it. No one else can turn you off. Um, then there was this next phase of the revolution, which is uh, assets beyond just currencies. So NFTs, digital art, uh, what we're working on is like a decentralized identity, like a username uh, for Web3. And each individual domain name is, a, is an NFT. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a crazy ride over the past 10 years. It's fun because you know, on siliconangle.com, uh, which we founded, we were covering early days of crypto. In fact, our first website, we, the, the developer wanted to be paid in crypto. It was interesting. Price of Bitcoin, I won't say that, how low it was. But then you saw, you saw the, you know, the ICO wave, the tokens started coming in. You started seeing much more uh, engineering focus, a lot of white papers coming out, a lot of cool ideas. And then now you got this mainstream of it. So I got to ask you, what are the coolest things you guys are working on? Because Unstoppable has a solution that solves a problem today and, and that people are facing. At the same time, it is part of this new architecture. What problem do you guys solve right now that's in market that you're seeing the most traction on? Yeah, so it's really about, so whenever you inter interact with a blockchain, you wind up having to deal with one of these really, really crazy public keys, uh, public addresses. And they're like anywhere from 20 to 40 characters long, they're random, uh, they're impossible to memorize. And going back to even early days in crypto, I think pe people knew that this tech was not going to go mainstream if you have to copy and paste these things around. If I'm getting ready to send you like a million dollars, I'm going to copy and paste some random string of numbers and letters. Uh, I'm going to have no confirmations about who I'm sending it to, and I'm going to hope that it works out. Uh, it's just not practical. People have kind of always known there was going to be a, a, a solution. And one of the more popular ideas was uh, doing kind of like what, what DNS did, which is uh, instead of having to deal with these crazy IP addresses, this long random string of numbers to find a website, uh, you have a, a name, like a, a keyword, something that's easy to remember. Uh, you know, like a hotels.com or something like that. Um, and so what NFT domains are is basically the same thing, uh, but for blockchain addresses. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just better and easier. There's this joke that everybody, you know, if you want to send me money, you're going to send me a test transaction of, you know, like a dollar first, um, just to make sure that I get it. Call me up and make sure that I get it before you go and send the big amount. Um, just not the way moving, you know, billions of dollars of value is going to work in the future. Yeah, and I think one of the things you just pointed out, make it easier, one of these, when you have these new waves, these shifts, we saw it with the web, um, web pages, more and more web pages were coming on, more online users, they called it online populations growing. Here, the same thing's happening, and, and the focus is on ease of use, making things simpler to understand, and reducing the step it takes to do things, right? This is kind of, kind of what is going on, and with the developer community, and what Ethereum has done really well is brought in the developers. So that's the, that's the convergence of all the action. And so when you, so that's where you're at right now. How do you go forward from here? Obviously there's business development deals to do. You guys are partnering a lot. What's the strategy? What are some of the things that you can share about some of your business activity that points to how mainstream it is and where it's going? So I think the, 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 way, to, the way to think about an NFT domain name is that it's meant to be uh, like your identity on Web3. So it's going to have a lot of different contexts. It's kind of like your, your Venmo account where you could 
uh, send me money to brad.crypto can be your decentralized website where you can check out my content at brad.crypto. Uh, it can also be my like login, kind of like a decentralized Facebook uh, OAuth where I can log into dApps and share information about myself um, and bring my data along with me. So it's got all of these, uh, all, all of these different, all these different things that it can do. Um, but where it's starting is uh, inside of crypto wallets and crypto apps, and they are adopting it for this identity, this identity idea. Uh, and it's the same identity across all your apps. That's the thing that's kind of, that's new here. Um, so, so yeah, that's the, that's the really, that's the really big and profound shift that's happening. And the reason why this is going to be maybe even more important than a lot of, you know, your, your listeners think is that everyone's going to have a crypto wallet. Every person in the world is going to have a crypto wallet. Uh, every app, every consumer app that you use is going to build one in. Twitter just launched, just built one. Reddit is building one. Uh, you're seeing it across all the consumer finance apps. So it's not just the crypto companies that you're thinking of. Every app's going to have a wallet, and and, and it's going to really, it's going to really change the way that we use the internet. I think there's a couple of things you pointed. Out I want to get your reaction to and thoughts more on. Um, this concept of dApps or decentralized applications, dApps, or depending on what you call it. This is applications and that take advantage of, of the architecture. And then this idea of users owning their own data. And this absolutely reverses the, the script today. Today you see Facebook, you see LinkedIn, all these silos. They own the data, the, you are the product. Here, the users are in control, they have their data, but the apps are being built for it, for the paradigm shift here. Right, that's that's what's happening. Is that right? Totally, totally. And and so it, it all starts. I mean, DAP is just this crazy term. It feels like it's this like really foreign, weird thing. All it means is that you sign in with your wallet uh, instead of signing in with a username and password, where the data is stored inside of that app, like inside of Facebook. So that's that's the only real like core underneath difference to keep in mind. Signing in with the wallet. But that is like a complete sea change in the way the internet works because I have this, this key, this private key, it's on my phone or my device or whatever, and I'm the only one that has it. So if somebody wanted to hack me, they need to go get access to my device. Uh, two years ago when Twitter got hacked, Barack Obama and Elon Musk were tweeting the same stuff. That's because Twitter had all the data. And so you needed to hack Twitter instead of each individual person. It's a completely different security model uh, it's it's way better for users to have that. But if you're thinking from the user perspective, what's going to happen is is that instead of Facebook storing all of my data and then me being trapped inside of Facebook, I'm going to store it and I'm going to move around on the internet, logging in with my Web3 username, my 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 NFT domain name, and uh, I'm going to have all my data with me, and then I could use a hundred different Facebooks all in one day, and it would be effortless for me to go and move from one to the other. So the monopoly situation that we exist in as a society is because of the way data storage works. So that's and the huge point. So let's just, let's double down on that for one more second. This is a huge point. I want to get your thoughts. I think people don't understand that in the mainstream, having that horizontal traversal or, or, or ability to move around with your identity, in this case, uh, your unstoppable domain and, and, and your data allows the user to take it from place to place. It's like going to other apps that, that could be like Facebook where the user's in charge and they're either deciding whether to share their data or not, or they're certainly can accumulate their data. And this allows for more of a horizontal scalability for the user, not for a company. Yeah, and what's going to happen is, is users are building up their reputation. They're building up their identity in Web3. So you have your username and you have your, your profile and you have certain badges of you know activities that you've done and you're building up this reputation and now apps are looking at that and they're starting to create social networks and other things uh, to provide me services because I it started with the user uh, and so the user is starting to collect all this valuable data and then apps are saying well hey um, let me give you a special experience based on that but the real thing and this is like this is like the core, I mean, this is just like a core capitalist idea in general. If you have more competition, you get a better experience for users. We have not had competition 
on, on in Web2 for decades because these companies have become monopolies. And what Web3 is really allowing is this wide open competition. And, and, and that is what, that's the core thing. Like, it's not like, you know, it's going to take time for, a, for, for Web3 to get better than Web2. Yeah. You know, it's very, very early days. But the reason why it's going to work is because of the competitive aspect here. Like, you can just, it's just so much better for consumers. When this happens. I would also add to that. First of all, great point, great insight. I would also add that the web presence technology based upon DNS specifically, is first of all, it's ASCII, so it's not foreign character sets, not Unicode for, for the geeks out there. But that's limiting too. It limits you to be on a site. And so I think the combination of kind of inadequate or antiquated DNS has limitations. So if, it, and that doesn't help communities, right? So when you're in the communities, you have potentially marketplaces that could be in anywhere. So if you have a, a ID, I'm just kind of thinking it forward here, but if you have your own data and your own ID, you can jump into a marketplace, two-sided marketplace anywhere. An app can provide that. If the community is robust, this is kind of where I see the use case going. How do you guys, do you guys agree with that statement? And how do you see that ability for the user to take advantage of other competitive or new emerging communities or marketplaces? So I think it all comes down, so I, identity is just this huge problem in Web2. And part of the reason why it's very, very hard uh, for new marketplaces and new communities to emerge is because you need all kinds of trust and reputation. And it's very hard to get to get real information about the users that you're interacting with. If you're if you're in the Web3 paradigm, then what happens is, is you can go and check certain things on the blockchain to see if they're true. And you can know that they're true 100%. You can know that I have used Uniswap in the past 30 days and OpenSea in the past 30 days. You can know uh, for sure that this wallet is mine. The same owner of this wallet also owns this other wallet, owns this certain asset. So all, all of the, having the ability to know certain things about a stranger is really what's going to change behavior. And one of the things that we're really excited about is being able to prove information about yourself without sharing it. Yeah. So I can tell you, hey, uh, I'm a unique person. I'm an American. I'm not an American, uh, but I don't have to tell you who I am. And, and you can still know that it's true. Um, and, and that is that concept is going to be what enables what you're talking about. I'm going to be able to show up in some new community that, that was created two hours ago, and we can all trust each other that a certain set of facts are true. Yeah. And, and that's possible because and exchange, of exchange and exchange value with smart contracts and other no middlemen involved activities, which is the promise of the new decentralized. Web. All right, so let me ask you a question on that because I think this is key. The anonymous point is huge. If you look at um, any kind of abstraction layers or any evolution in, in technology over the years, it's always been about cleaning up the mess or, the, or uh, extending capabilities of something that was inadequate. We mentioned DNS, now you got this. There's a lot of problems with Web 2.0, 2, um, 2 social bots. You mentioned bots. Bots are anonymous and they don't have a lot of time in market. So it's easy to start bots and everyone who does either scraping bots, everyone knows this. What you just pointed out was an anonymous environment that was user choice, but has all the data that could be verified. So it's almost like a blue check mark on Twitter without your name. Kind of. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be hundreds of check marks, but exactly. Because there's so many different things that you're going to want to be, you're going to want to communicate to strangers. Um, but that's exactly the right, that's exactly the right mental model. It's going to be these check marks uh, for all kinds of different contexts. And that's what's going to uh, enable people to trust that they're, you know, you're talking to a real person or you're talking to the type of person you thought you were talking to, uh, et cetera. But yeah, it's, it's you know, I, I think that the issues that we have with bots today are because uh, Web2 has failed at solving identity. Um, I think Facebook at one point was deleting half a billion fake accounts per quarter, something like the entire number of user profiles they were deleting per, you know, per year. Um, so it's just, just a total. And they spring up like mushrooms, they just pop up. The thing, this is the problem. I mean, the data that you acquire in these siloed platforms is used by the, the company. So you don't own the data, so you become the product as the cliche goes. But what you're saying is if you have an identity and you pop around to multiple sites, you also have your digital footprints and your exhaust that you own. Okay, that's time, that's reputation data. I mean, you can cut it any way you want, but the point is 
it's your stuff over time. That's yours and that's immutable it's on the blockchain. You can store it and have, make that permanent and add to it. Exactly. That's, that's a time-based thing versus today, bots that are spreading misinformation can, can get popped up when they get killed, they just start another one. So time actually is a metric for quality here. Absolutely, and people already use it in the crypto world to say like, hey, this wallet was created greater than two years ago. This wallet has had, a, you know, had, has had transactions for at least three or four years. Like this is probably a real, you know, this is probably a, legit, a legitimate user. And anybody can look that up. I mean, we could we go look it up together right now on, on Etherscan, it would take, you know, a minute. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I'm a big fan, I can tell. I love this product. Uh, I think you guys are going to do really well. Congratulations, I'm a big fan. I think this is needed. What are some of the deals you've done? Blockchain.com is one and Opera. Can you take us through those deals and, and why they're working with you? Let's start with blockchain.com. Yeah, so the whole thing here is that uh, this identity standard for Web3 uh, apps need to choose to support it. So you know, we spent several years as a company uh, working to get as many crypto wallets and uh, browsers and crypto exchanges to support this to support this identity standard. Um, some of the some of the, the the largest and probably you know most most popular uh, companies to have done this are Blockchain.com, for example. Blockchain.com, one of the largest crypto wallets in the world, uh, and you can uh, use your domain names. Uh, instead of crypto addresses, and 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 this is this is this is super cool because blockchain.com in particular focuses on uh, onboarding new users, so they're very focused on how we're going to get the next four billion internet users uh, to use this tech. And, and they said, you know, usernames are going to be essential. Like, how can we onboard this next several billion people if we have to explain to them about all these crazy addresses and it's, it's not just one like we want to give you 10 40 character addresses for all these different contexts like it's just it's just it's just no way people are going to be able to do that without uh without having a username so um that's why we're really excited about uh about what blockchain.com is doing They're, they they want to train users that this is the way uh you should use the tech yeah and certainly no one wants to remember i remember how I'd writing down all my you know, writing, I, I'm not a, I was never a big wallet fan because of all the hacks. I used to write it down and store it in my safe. But if the house burns down or I, I kick the can, I'm, uh, who's going to find it, right? So again, these are all important things. Your key, storing it, securing it, uh, super important. Talk about Opera. Um, that's an interesting partnership because it's got a browser. If people know what it is, what are they doing different? I can almost imagine they're innovating around the identity and, and what people's experiences with what they touch. Yeah, so this is this is one of those things that's a little bit easier, and I strongly encourage everybody to go and try DApps uh, after this because this is going to be one of those concepts that'll be a little easier if you if you try it than if you hear about it. But the concept of a wallet and a browser are kind of merging, so it makes sense to have a wallet inside of your browser because when you go to a website, the website's going to want you to sign in with your wallet. So having that be in one app is quite convenient for users. And so Opera was one of the trailblazers, uh, a traditional browser uh, that added a crypto wallet so that you can store money in there. Uh, and then also added support for domain names for payments and for websites. So you can type in brad.crypto and you can send me money, or you can type in brad.crypto into the browser and you can check out my, my website. I've got a little uh, NFT gallery. You can see my collection up there right now. Um, so that's the that, that's the idea is that browsers have this kind of superpower in uh, Web3. And what I think is going to happen, Opera and Brave have been kind of the trailblazers here. What I think is going to happen is that these traditional browsers are going to wake up and they're going to see that uh, integrating a wallet is critical uh, for them to be able to provide services to consumers. I mean, it, uh, is, it is an app. I mean, why not make it a D app as well, because why wouldn't I want to just send you crypto like Venmo you mentioned earlier, which people can understand that concept. Venmo me make my cash, same concept here, but built mm -hmm. into the browser, which is mm -hmm. not a browser anymore. It's a, a reader, a D app reader, basically mm -hmm. with a wallet. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so what does this mean for you guys and the marketplace? You got Opera pushing the envelope on browsing, changing the experience, enabling the applications to be discovered and navigated and consumed. You got blockchain.com blockchain with the wallets and being embedded there, good distribution. 
How, what, who are you looking for for partners? How do people partner? Let's just say the Cube wants to do NFTs and we want to have a login for our communities, which are all open. How do we partner with you? Or do we, we have to wait or is there a, I mean, take us through the partnership strategy. How do we, how do people engage with unstoppable domains? Yeah, so I mean, I think that if you're, you know, if you're a wallet or a crypto exchange, it's super easy. We would love to have you support uh, being able to send money using domains. We also have uh, all sorts of different kind of marketing activities we can do together. We can give out free stuff uh, to, to your communities. We have a bunch of education that we do. We're really trying to be this onboarding point to Web3. So there's, I think, a lot of, a lot of cool stuff we can do together on the commercial side and on the, the, the marketing side. Um, and then the other category that we didn't talk about was dApps. And we now have this login with Unstoppable Domains, uh, which you kind of uh, alluded to there. And so you can log in with your domain name and then you can give the app permission to get certain information about you or proof of information about you, not the actual information if you don't want to share it um, because it's your choice and you're in control. Uh, and so that would be that would be another thing. Like if if you all launch a DAP, we should absolutely have login with Unstoppable on there. Yeah, there's so much headroom here. You got a short-term solution with the exchange. Get that distribution. I get that. That's early days of the foundation. Push the distribution. Get you guys everywhere. But the real success comes in for the login. I mean, the sign-in, single sign-in concept. I think that's going to be powerful. Uh, great stuff. Okay, future. Tell us something we don't know about Unstoppable domains that people might be interested in. I think it's really, I think the, the thing that you're going to hear about a lot from us uh, in the future is going to be around this idea of identity, of being able to prove that you're a human uh, and be able to tell apps that. And apps are going to give you all kinds of special access uh, and rewards and all kinds of other things uh, because uh, because you gave them that information. So that's the, that's, that's probably, that's the hint I'm going to drop. You know, it's interesting, Brad, you bring trust, you bring quality verified data, choose intelligent software and machine learning, AI, and access to distributed communities and distributed applications. Interesting to see what the software does with that. Cause it traditionally didn't have that before. I mean, just in mind blowing. I mean, pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Brad, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing the insight. Co-founder of Unstoppable Domains, Brad Camp. Thanks for stopping by theCUBE's showcase with Unstoppable Domains. Thanks for having me.